A uh, call to order the June 1, 2023 meeting of the Sagatuck Short-Term Rental Task Force. Um, clerk, will you call the roll? Here. Hands. Here. Hart. Here. Clark. Here. Anderson. Here. Rizzotti. Here. 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 Before we uh, take a look at it and approve the agenda, I just know Lauren has to leave a few minutes early. So when she ducks out, that is why. Um, we need to approve the agenda, uh, voice, unless someone has any changes to it. Yep, uh, and when we make our motions, uh, we need to actually say what the motion is. So can someone make a motion to approve the agenda? Make a motion to approve the agenda. Second. second. Motion by Manns and second by Hart. Uh, and then we need uh, a motion to approve. Oh, pardon. Yes. Um, all in favor? Aye. Yeah. Aye. 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 Uh, Okay, on to the minutes. A motion to approve the minutes. Make a motion to approve the minutes. Second. I second to approve the minutes. Any um, any edits or corrections, changes? All right. All in favor? Aye. Uh, yes. Any opposed? Okay. Uh, now we get to the first public comment period. Reminder, we have one now for anything that's on the agenda, and then there's another co public comment period at the very end where you can make comment about anything. Um, uh, keep your comments to three minutes. Say where you're from. Um, and if you could also say what, for this one, what uh, agenda item you're commenting on. So is there anybody in the room? Hello, Jane. Hello. Oh, no. Good afternoon, folks. I'm Jane Underwood, 130 Perryman Street. And as I look around here, I suspect I've been here longer than anyone else. I've been reading the comments in the packet regarding the dire warnings if we don't continue with all the short-term rentals. Uh, I don't see Saugatuck as a doomsday book candidate. I've heard that for a hell of a lot of years. Uh, I can remember when the motorcycle gangs were here. I can remember people were afraid that the North Beach was going to scare away families. You know what? A lot of families came because they wanted to walk the North Beach. For those of you who know what I'm talking about. Uh, Saugatuck's been a tourist town for a long time. It was mostly hotels some inns and many people rented rooms and it seemed to work pretty well. I can also remember in the winter when we came up, there were stores open, there were people in town. I don't see that anymore. There's a couple stores that managed to stay open, but it's pretty dead. And if you drive around, especially on the hill, it's pretty dark and pretty empty. As a retired teacher, I worry about our excellent school system. We have a number of students who graduated from Saugatuck High School who are going to the University of Michigan. That's big time, big time. And I would like to see that continue. That should be a major draw for families with young children. Those of you sitting around this table have a tough job. You're gonna be damned if you do and damned if you don't. But let me make a couple suggestions. Yes, I think short-term rentals are here to stay. I suspect they're gonna slow down a little bit. They were very popular during the pandemic. People felt they could be safe with their own families. Higher interest rates are probably gonna put a little kibosh on home sales. I've had a couple offers, cash, whatever you want for my home. Sorry, not for sale. We need to get a handle on short-term rentals. We have to identify them. I know people are working at it. 
I've looked at the map. There's still a lot of red dots that have to be filled in. I think we need a professional person whose job is to oversee this. Their salary coming from the fees. One more comment. We need professionals inspecting these short-term rentals to be sure they are safe for the people that are coming in. Thanks, Jane. Thank you. Anyone else in the room? Okay, we'll go to Zoom. Uh, anyone wanting to make a comment on one of the uh, items that's on the agenda? Dick? Uh, yes, Dick Waskin, 6576 Heron Ridge Road, Saugatuck. Um, I'm commenting on the review discussion 5A, um, the uh, sheriff office's presentation on noise. And I was looking at his uh, report, and I thought it was really interesting to see uh, how many noise complaints were made in 21, 22 in this year, and how few there were from short-term rentals, because it seems like Many of the complaints I've heard some of the neighbors complaining about is the, the noise that short-term rentals bring in. But actually, according to this report, there were many more uh, complaints made by non-short-term rental uh, noise complaints. Uh, where I live in the summertime, I can hear clearly the football stadium over at the high school, the marching band, the play-by-plays of all the games. Uh, I hear a lot of that. I also hear... Um, on Sunday afternoon, we uh, get to hear a nice loud uh, band over at the uh, the Red Dock, which we appreciate. <laughs> and also in the evenings, we'll hear the thump, thump, thump of the Douglas Dunes. Uh, and I could be a grumpy old neighbor and say, hey, get off my lawn. I don't want to hear these noise. I'm complaining about them. But actually, my feeling about it is it shows the lifeblood of this town. It shows that people are out there enjoying themselves. People have come here and, and yes, we live in a city. We have neighbors. We're gonna hear our neighbors occasionally. Uh, if people get way out of hand, then yes, there needs to be enforcement. But I think it, whether it's a graduation party or whether it be short-term rental or whether it be just your neighbor doing something, uh, we have to be, I think, careful not to overreact uh, with our ordinances about noise but have a reasonable, uh, reasonable expectation and people just being polite and neighborly to each other and being, being fair to each other and not, not being an annoyance. So I just, I just wanted to bring that because it just seemed that was a real driving force for some people wanting to get new rules is talking about the noise going on. And actually, I don't think the noise is that big of a factor according to this report. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else on Zoom? Doesn't look like it. Anybody else in the room? Okay, we'll close the public comment section and move on to agenda number five, uh, beginning with the code enforcement analysis. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm gonna get off today uh, with uh, kind of touching on some enforcement pieces and then um, uh, Kyle from uh, McKenna is gonna kind of take it from there and guide you through the rest of your meeting. but. Um, so enforcement's been a, a common uh, uh, comments and uh, question and uh, that, that's come up from the, the task force, council members, planning commissioners, and certainly the community in their public comments. And so um, I thought it would be good to kind of do a little bit of an analysis and have a little discussion about enforcement um, this afternoon. Um, and it seems like the, the biggest uh, comment has been related to noise and folks having concern about uh, noise related issues um, that they uh, deem to be from from short term rental units. And so um, I asked the sheriff's office to kind of provide some data since January of 2021 um, with you know, how many noise complaints you know, has the city had you know, the, last, the last couple of years. And then I was able to take that list and actually um, look at the addresses and kind of determine um, which ones at least had a, an active short-term rental certificate at the time the noise complaint was made with the caveat that, you know, an owner could have been occupying the property at the time and, and had a party or something like that. And maybe it wasn't, you know, renters, but assuming they were, 
Uh, we had 22 noise complaints in 2021, and 10 of them were um, related to short-term rental units. And then in uh, 2022, there were 23, and eight were related to short-term rental units. Um, and then this data was from a couple uh, weeks ago. So as of you know, year to date, as of a couple weeks ago, we've had three noise complaints so far this year. Uh, Memorial Day may have may have added to that total, and, and uh, Captain Ensfield's here tonight uh, and, and can touch on that. Um, the caveat and, and one point uh, to make on this is that these are noise complaints where there was an actual complainant. Somebody called was willing to actually be a complainant about the noise, not a situation where there was anonymous callers and Captain Ensfield's going to kind of touch on how these complaints are handled and what they need to actually enforce a complaint. So um, since noise is a, a big piece, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Captain Ensfield and let him kind of talk about the enforcement process and what that looks like for noise. Thank you. Thank you, Captain, for joining us. Hi. Thank you very much for uh, allowing me to come in and speak to you guys. Um, I kind of created some kind of notes and stuff. Um, I did pull those numbers uh, at Ryan's request. Um, let me kind of clarify that, though, because I'll, I'll kind of go through what our typical noise complaint in town is. So those numbers probably don't truly uh, encapsulate all the complaints that we receive. Uh, if somebody calls in anonymously, um, what typically happens is on, a, let's say it's a, a weeknight um, or weekend night, if the officer's out on a call or somebody wants to remain anonymous, our dispatch will put it out as like an area patrol um, or, you know, check the area. Uh, no complaint number will be assigned. And it kind of puts us in a hard spot because, um, let me back up a little bit here. Uh, the police cannot be a complainant in a noise complaint. So without somebody being a complainant or saying this is a public nuisance, the police cannot take any enforcement action. So I can't just walk down the street and go, oh, you're way too loud. I'm going to write you a citation. I don't think anybody wants to live in the uh, neighborhood that, you know, has that anyway. But with that being said, uh, we have a high number of complaints that are called in that nobody wants to be, nobody wants to complain about their neighbor. They just want to call in and say, hey, tell them to be quiet. When we do make contact with these places, um, there is a high degree of compliance. Nobody wants to have any problems. They're renting a nice house. They, you know, they're good people. They, you know, comply with what we have said. Since we've been here within the contract, we have written, I called our district court, we have written zero citations for loud noise in the, in the city of Saugatuck. With that being said, the ordinances in the city of Saugatuck are kind of old and antiquated. They are very liberal for us to perceive what we want to write citations for. So with that being said, we don't want to get into the situation where we're writing citation for this person. And then two days later, somebody else is writing a citation for something else and it doesn't, you know, mesh. We want to have consistency and um, for enforcement. And I think everybody want everybody wants that. Uh, another thing we, we commonly see is, uh, you know, especially the calls up on the hill and stuff is about the time of night where the intox individuals are walking up, up the hill and going to uh, the house and they may not know where the noise is coming from. They assume it's the neighbors, you know, so that kind of gets thrown in the mix also. Um, when we do go to these houses and stuff, what our, what our biggest thing is, is that <clears throat> When we, if we have a complaint at a house we make contact with, we don't know that we're talking to the person that actually rented the house. You know, typically what we get is, oh, the police are here, and they send out the the soberest person to talk to us, <laughs> and then after like five minutes, the drunkest person comes out and tries to be the attorney. <laughs> <laughs> so we have, you know, the the two extremes there, and. You know, if we write a citation to somebody, you know, it's a, are we actually writing it to the person that's even, you know, uh, has any standing to be the person the citation be read it to at the, at the residence? We don't know that. We don't know that what the, what the, if the house was running to them or not either. So that's, that's a one little area that we have. And also the loud noise is very subjective. Um, one person's annoyance may not be somebody else's annoyance. Um, you know, if you own a, own a bar restaurant downtown, you hear loud music and you hear everybody partying and stuff, and you go, hey, I'm making a lot of money tonight. <laughs> Somebody else that, you know, it's going to be annoyance to them. Um, so we have to kind of work through all those and, uh, you know, try to take enforcement to uh, 
what we think is fair. Um, another other aspect too that we sometimes have is the rental houses complaining against the rental houses, where you know the property owner you know paints it as a nice, quaint, quiet uh, cottage, and all of a sudden it's not. You know, you're right next to you know Pumpernickels or something you know downtown, and it's you know they got little kids. So that's where we kind of run into some issues too with you know with that. Also, countywide, we've had some noise complaints where um, the judges have ruled in a case where the neighbors are complaining about another neighbor's. There, this is out in the county, so it's a little bit further distance. But this probably could have some standing in here. So we it kind of gives you a uh, picture of what the judges actually look at when they rule on a, a ordinance or rule or law violation would be this. If the immediate neighbor is not complaining, these neighbors were down the road, they they ruled that if the immediate neighbor was not to complain it, that there's really not a noise complaint because they really have the first right to be the one that complains. So that kind of countywide, that kind of puts us in a, you know, a, a strange boat, you know, what, and then you come, come here and it's like, you know, somebody five houses down is complaining and you're like, how do we, how do we fairly do that? But like I said earlier, there's, there is a high compliance um, when we do talk to people. Um, some things that could probably help us, uh, I, I talked to Ryan a little bit is, you know, maybe some uh, consistency in some of the rental agreements. Um, when we go talk to people, they fear getting kicked out. They fear retribution. They don't fear the police. They fear that, hey, we need to be quiet or we're going to get kicked out of here. Um, so I think if, you know, the owners or, you know, property managers, you know, have, you know, good written contracts, good um, communication beforehand, I think that's, you know, really good for us to have uh, good enforcement. Also, you know, contact with the neighbors, you know, um, you know, let, let the, give the neighbors a cell phone number or phone number to call and or, you know, if there's a registry that, of all the rental houses that we could have contact with, we could call uh, at night and make contact with somebody that's, you know, can, you know, reverse around and say, hey, you need to be quiet because the police has called me and this is serious because the neighbor's complaining. Um, you know, in my personal experience, we have a rental house right next door to our house. Um, I have the, the manager's uh, phone number. I don't call him unless necessary. Um, and, uh, you know, at the day's end, we don't have to like each other, but we have to respect each other. Um, and, you know, I think that, you know, with good understanding with the neighbors and these rental houses and stuff, I think, uh, you know, things can commingle. Um, you know, obviously there's going to be some bumps in the road with that type of stuff. Um, let's look at something else here. We can't. So the list. Yeah, yeah, something like that would be, you know, the, the, in, in my my recommendation, or you know, not my personal recommendation, not from the sheriff's office, would be some type of. Uh, I know in the businesses and stuff downtown here, we have a usually we have a contact list where if we find an open door, we can contact the owner. Um, you know, we can find that roundabout way. We can look up the taxes and you know, kind of go with that roundabout way. But you know, the best way is to be able to call a phone number and 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 have somebody where we can immediately contact somebody and vice versa. That's, you know, for, uh, you know, the home homeowners protection also, or, or a property owner, because, you know, if we see something that's out of the ordinary, we have somebody that we can immediately call and say, Hey, this is kind of strange, you know, and uh, you know, it gives us a you know good tool to uh, work with also. Um, Also, uh, also countywide too. We've had a couple uh, instances where um, this is just uh, you know the throw out there is a couple instances of we've seen flyers up charging money for large parties at rental houses. We've you know and then when they had good rental agreements, um, you know we were able to call the the property owner. You know they had no idea that was going on. And uh, they were able to, you know, stop that, you know, in these, sometimes in the other areas, these large parties can, you know, cause significant damage to, you know, residences and stuff. I just don't want to see that either. 
Um, and I think that's about all I had for notes. So, do you have any questions? Questions? Yeah, questions. I have a question. You, yeah. You mentioned that Saga Tuck's noise ordinances are somewhat antiquated. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? They're just so broad, you know. I mean, I think you can get really in depth of, you know, everybody wants to have a, a meter and, you know, that those, those things are just so, you know, subjective and, you know, you got to have the right training the the, they have to be you know, looked at all the time. And, that, you know, down, down here, everything's going to be probably a noise violation of some sort. Um, you know, I think it's when you're dealing with noise and annoyance and stuff, it's all subjective. So, I mean, if somebody had a band playing right next to somebody's house, you know, right in their next door yard, you know, you're going to have to have somebody, a judge or, you know, a jury or something like that say, yeah, this is, this is definitely a public annoyance. Somebody standing out having a pool party, you know, with, you know, little kids and stuff like that. It's probably not going to be, it, you know, but that is an annoyance to somebody. So, I mean, it's, it's all about how, you know, everybody relates to it and stuff. I, it just, it's hard to describe what a loud noise is and what, what's an annoyance, you know, for enforcement on things, you know, people, that, people, that tend also, to, people tend to call police to solve their problems. Yeah. Sometimes <laughs> it, you know, sometimes it makes it worse, you know, so. So does that correlate to the fact that no citations were issued for any of the noise complaints or is it just because? We had high compliance with when we met, went and made contact with people and we're, we want to make sure some, you know, somebody's coming to our community and want, and, you know, running a house or whatever. And, and we want to give them a warning and, you know, say, Hey, this is too loud, you know, turn it down. Um, I think everybody, everybody would want that, um, you know, courtesy to, to have that. So instead of this, us right coming up and writing a citation, if we have to come back, then yeah, I mean, that's, you know, we would definitely look at, you know, take an enforcement action. Yes. I'm curious if we were to institute something that talks about quiet hours, you know, say like 10 to 8 or something like that, how many of the complaints that you get happen after what would be like 10 or 11 o'clock at night versus complaints you get earlier in the day? Um, I think a lot of them are. Oh. I, I, I didn't look at the times on that in the sheet and stuff. Um, I would just going off pure my just working experience, I would say there's probably higher uh, amount of complaints probably coming in after after hours. That's what I guess too. Yeah, okay. I mean pe most people aren't going to aren't calling in on unless they're really annoyed. But yeah, at night it just doesn't yeah. happen. Yeah. I have, so we we do have an agreement, and we've actually I think in Sagatuck is actually eleven o'clock. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And so we say in our agreement it's ten o'clock, um, and then we they have to sign it in order for them to get an actual door code, so they can't get in unless they've actually signed that. We've definitely changed all of our language, um, you know, whether it's occupancy, um, any of these things that, you know, we've made it very sure. And some people will fight us and say, well, that's why I'm going to Airbnb and VRBO so I don't have to deal with you. And we're like, well, we're sorry that this is our policy. So you can either choose to forfeit your reservation because we're saying it's protective for both us as a company and then the homeowner. We do have a whole uh, paragraph in there about, um, you know, it's like nice neighbors, I think we call it. And, you know, in that case, so um, I think there's things that can be done and, you know, with with everyone's kind of, you know, input and moving forward. But I think a lot of the self-managed ones are the ones that are kind of, you know, hurting, yeah, the community in some way. And, and sometimes we find that, you know, alcohol is involved, it, you know, everybody thinks they're quiet and they're not really quiet. You know, it's like, you know, it was, yes. I just want to let you know I agree with you that noise is very difficult to monitor or determine. I mean, every morning I have a coffee at 5.30 in the morning and I hear that mail truck come flying through town and his tailgate makes so much noise, but I know it's 5.30 because he comes through at 5.30. <laughs> in my career, I'd get noise complaints all the time. But if that mail was not there at eight o'clock in the morning, he'd have more complaints that the mail didn't show up. So. I just wanted to let you know that I, I understand and I appreciate the fact that you have to take each situation as a whole and determine whether or not it's an issue or just yeah. a and complaint, I guess is the right way to yeah. put it. And yeah. we've had complaints in town where we've come to the, the, the city manager and, and 
you know, have talked about, do you want enforcement with this or not? You know, and, you know, just because, I mean, it's going to be a court battle, you know, potentially with, with certain things, especially if you're talking about businesses. You know, if a business has something that, you know, it's like, where do you, where do you draw the line at? You know, where, what's, what's acceptable, what's not acceptable. And I think that goes back to the friendly neighbor. I mean, mm -hmm. if the neighbor thinks STR or the private party is loud, I don't think if you're a good neighbor, you, you should be scared to go next door and say, hey, excuse me, yeah. but we feel that you're a little bit noisy. And if you're a proper STR person, not they start cussing and swearing and right. be belligerent, that's another step in the process. But yeah. I bet 99% of the time, just voice your opinion and or if there's a I mean whenever I have a party I talk to all my neighbors and say hey, just so you know we're gonna have extra cars on the street it's gonna go till 10 right if you got a problem and most of the time they say what time's the party gonna be <laughs> they want to join but it, it does allow them to know what's going on and uh, it, you know it makes everyone conscious and 10 o'clock you say time to go through my experience it's just Parma for 26 years Anytime neighbor calls the police on the other neighbor, usually negotiations and <laughs> you know, those type of talks, it's like, you know, that, that, that ruins everything of being neighborly, you know? So it's like, yep. you know, uh, I, I agree with you. I think things, you know, I, and who knows how many of these noise complaints are settled that way. Just like, Hey, you know, knock it, knock it off, you know, or, you know, they go over and talk to the renter. I, I've gone over and talked to the renters or, you know, next yep. door. They said, Hey, you got to quiet down. I got a little kid, you know, kind of thing. And, Oh, sorry, you know, kind of thing. Or just try to be neighborly. So great. Thank you. Anything else before we we'll catch you in the public comment afterwards. Okay. Um, um can we as a board or whoever we are, yeah, task force, can we, you know, begin to put these thoughts into some type of actual mandate and structure with with moving forward? I think that's what the public wants us to. And actual have some substance to it, for example, to require maybe it could be part of the fire inspection portion of the short term rental that a checkbox on somewhere in this document that states that the address and the representative um, is added to the database to share with our police force. And so, you know, someone had asked. You know, you so you can put up and you're not looking through tax records at 11 o'clock at night to see who it is like, oh, this is, um, you know, one, two, three Main Street. This is represented by so and so. And maybe like let's actually have steps in place. I mean, I'd like to share similar to what we shared earlier about kind of what we did. And I said this last week, a lot of this comes down to being preventative medicine and trying to mitigate the issues before they get there. And I just want to read you a snippet. And this is in every one of our houses. And this is in addition to the contract that they sign, the fact that they must be 25 years old, the fact they must abide by these guidelines. But in addition, right on the refrigerator or in a highly visible place, um, and I'm, I won't read you the whole thing, but um, just like our vacation rental, our neighborhood is extremely important to us. Most of your neighbors live here full time and like you also want to enjoy their home with their families and friends. We hope you have lots of laughs and fun during the vacation. However, we would appreciate out of respect to our community, noise levels are kept down to a minimum, especially after dark. Respecting your neighbors and properties around you will make your vacation more enjoyable and ensure wonderful experiences for everyone within your surroundings. As a reminder, and this is part of the contract that they've already signed, and again, this is common sense stuff. Here are our core common courtesy guidelines that you have agreed upon in your signed rental agreement that pertain to just being a good neighbor. And what I've gathered in the month that we've been together is the four core things are noise, trash, parking, and occupancy. Okay, so noise, bullet point one, per noise ordinance, please avoid making any loud noises between 10 p.m. and 10 p.m., even though it might be 11. Um, to allow neighbors a peaceful night's sleep and to enjoy their morning coffee. A noise violation could result in an eviction and a fine from the city. Now, I don't even know if that's true, but I want, I want to, you know, I want to scare them out of making a dumb decision and, and getting to that point. But so, A, you have the information. So at the moment, you can contact who represents that home. 
most likely the conversation you have will put it to bed based on what you've shared with us. If it goes any further, it's an eviction, it's a fine. And I, if it was my guy, and that's stated already here, I already have their credit card information, $200 for not abiding by our guidelines, it's tacked onto their bill. It's that simple. Yeah, it's instant too. You know, that's the thing. It's like, you know, if we write them a citation or something like that, it's, you know, it's, yeah. So McKenna is capturing all the, the information we're sharing. So as we come up with recommendations, it will get factored in. Um, and it'd be great if we can get a copy of that we can put it in the next packet so everybody can read the whole thing. I think that'd be helpful. Great. Uh, move on to the next. Thank you so much, Captain. No Appreciate it. Yes, thank you, Captain Ensfield. And so I hope that that helped at least kind of sets realistic expectations about what the, the city can and can't do. You know, we're not we're not driving around looking for noise violations, but certainly the sheriff's office is there to respond to complaints and then and then uh, act accordingly. Involuntary compliance is certainly the goal. Um, so I just want to run through just kind of a, a few things the city at least has done the last couple of years related to um, enforcement, even though it may not be like enforcement in the sense of thinking like tickets being written or citations being issued, um, you know, trying to gain compliance with our, our ordinances. So in 2021, uh, the city council actually passed a short term rental investigation fee policy that pretty much, you know, laid out, hey, as staff, this is the way we want you to handle um, either complaints or short unregistered short term rentals that you come across. And so we want you to, to try to send them a courtesy reminder, uh, to, you know, to register. Uh, and then there's kind of a process to go through with first notices and second notices and then investigation fees actually being assessed to the unregistered property um, if they're actually non responsive to the actual notices and, and letters that are being sent to them on up to actually issuing um, uh, civil infraction citations. So I just wanted to make the uh, the task force aware that, that there is a policy that currently exists that uh, the city council has set. Um, you could certainly make recommendations that that be modified in some way. Um, I wanted to make sure that was on your radar. Uh, in 2022, um, uh, uh, Kate White, who was our, our project coordinator um, with the city, had actually went through the, the rental listings uh, that were available online and actually went through home by home, uh, which is actually rather cumbersome because it's, they're not listed by address. And so you actually have to do a little bit of digging to figure out which home is wh which, especially if you're looking at indoor photos. But she went through each property to say, okay, is it registered? Is it not registered? Did it be registered? Um, because some of the listings contain like bed and breakfast units or motel units. And then uh, the city did, you know, quite a bit of a enforcement through that as far as sending letters and trying to bring properties into compliance. And I think, you know, there was an uptick there. Um, and then in 2023, since I've uh, come on board with the city, um, kind of worked to clean up our short-term rental applications hold list. There was a number of uh, applications, several that were in a hold status, largely because they hadn't received like fire department inspections. And a lot of it was related to um, COVID happened and there was challenges with getting applications to the fire department and things were lost in, in the shuffle. And so um, we're, we're pretty much at the end of that process of trying to clean up those old holds where we have folks um, compliant or closed out if they're, they're no longer short-term running. Um, I, as a proactive measure, send friendly reminder letters uh, to short-term rental units that will soon expire. So about a month or two before they're going to expire, I try to send out a letter uh, indicating, hey, your short-term rental is going to, you know, the certificate is going to expire soon. Um, uh, please make sure and fill out the new application so that way you can get your inspection in place and, and try to avoid having to deal with ex expirations and then gaps in time where they're not really registered and shouldn't be renting anymore and, and that sort of thing. Um, and then any complaints that, that we receive, um, you know, we do follow up and investigate those. So if somebody makes a complaint that we have an unregistered rental, um, I do follow up on those complaints and, and follow that process that the city council uh, established. And then there's times as I'm working through the day-to-day -day work that I may become aware myself of a, a run registered rental, and then I, I handle it accordingly um, as well. So um, next slide is kind of violation fees. Um, Fees have come up. So if the city were to actually issue a, a civil infraction notice or civil infraction citation, these are the, are the fees that are essentially assessed. So even if there was an actual noise complaint, the fine for a first violation, according to our code of ordinances, is $25. Um, 
garbage seems to be like a complaint with like trash totes being left out um you know at short short term rental units same thing if we were to actually write a citation for that it, it's twenty five dollars um if there's parking violations um if they're writing them under our code our city code of ordinances and captain can correct me if I'm saying anything wrong here on parking citations but um, most of them are essentially $25. There's one that's up to hundred dollars, but that's like parking in like a handicap space. So most of them are, are $25. Um, if there's an actual like fire code violation. That's where we get into some of the actual checklist items that you're re responsible for is, and that the fire department is inspecting when they, before your short-term rental certificates issued, those are a little higher, right? $250 for a first violation on those. Um, and then if we get into a situation where like, you know, you're an unregistered rental or you're not actually following what's in the zoning ordinance related to um, a short-term rental unit, um, the, the fine for a first violation is $100. So the task force, yep, go ahead. I'm sorry, Ryan, quick question. And these fees go to, in every case in the short-term rental, go to the owner or go to the occupants? So I, I think it, Depends. depends. Yeah, I think it's going to depend on what the actual issue is. If it's the owner renting it out and it's unregistered, certainly to the owner. If it's a, a noise violation issue, I think then we get into questions like Captain Enfield is struggling with sometimes with, you know, who's there and who are we actually writing the citation to. I definitely think there maybe should be discussion too at some point of increasing these fees. Um, I hate to say it, money talks. <laughs> so, you know, it's, um, you know, even noticing that, you know, as COVID obviously has changed the dynamics and the landmark for all of us, um, you know, looking at the process, we go, the registration uh, for people that let's say they're not, um, I know like South Haven has, you know, a very high fee that if they don't register after a certain period of time, it's, it's like almost about $750, $1,000 if they don't have them, if they don't register. Um, so that kind of inhibits, you know, that, and I think, you know, even from management, I mean, we would be the ones probably if there was a guest in there and garbage or like a park, well, parking, that would be the people, but, you know, some of these fines, um, you know, we would be responsible for. And so, and I just think that there should be an increase because these seem pretty like, oh, that's 25 bucks. I mean, in Chicago, a parking ticket's a hundred dollars period. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just a basic, your meter runs out. So, um, so I think, you know, maybe at some point table that or have some discussions about possibly increasing that to, mm -hmm. to at least enforce or enhance some of the ordinances. Certainly, that could be a recommendation from the task force. In fact, I think the one of your duty was to look at fees and whether or not there should be some increases. And I think that could include violation fees as well. So um, next slide is kind of just, this is not an exhaustive list. I just wanted to point out a few enforcement challenges or things to think about. Um, so like occupancy comes up a lot and, and like, well, you know, we should, you know, enforce our occupancy limits. So there are challenges with that, at least from the, the city side of it. I think certainly rental agents are probably more in tune with it as they're they're renting units out. But but here's kind of the challenge the city has. You know, we're not going to like go out and knock on somebody's door in the middle of the night and count how many people are are there sleeping. The other challenge I think that we have with that too is that if you know if a lot of times folks will rent or come into town with maybe other families or other folks and maybe they're renting multiple properties and so um, you know. For example, you have an outdoor deck, maybe you're gonna grill out with other people that that are visiting here with you. You know, that that occupancy that's kind of set is is, is more focused on, you know, sleeping. Um, so there's some challenges with actually kind of enforcing that um, uh, and, and trying to kind of have some accountability there. So just the challenge to think through. Um, certainly resources are always limited in everything we do in government. And so, um, you know, more, time sensitive proactive enforcement does take more in resources and so like you know physically checking and regularly checking listing sites um even if we had like a list that was provided to us by a, a third party would still take um you know some staff time to do that um so those are kind of larger policy decisions that you know our our, our council members would would have to decide upon um, you know, it's pretty time intensive. Like we talked about the single contract provisions last time and making sure that, you know, for example, ADUs and single family dwellings are being rented out, you know, under a single contract. You know, it takes a lot of follow up to investigate whether or not that's occurring the way that it should and, and looking at listings and looking at, you know, um, how things are being booked and 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 going from there. So um, there's just it, it's just more time intensive. It takes time to do that. Um, 
we talked about complainants for noise, so I won't touch on that, but, um, you know, to actually enforce some ac an actual noise complaint there, you know, Mr. Uh, Captain Ensel talked about having an actual complainant and then not being the sheriff's office or an anonymous person. Um, and then um, the other thing that's come up is, you know, kind of like parking, right? And, and, and certainly, ideally, if, if you have parking requirements for short-term rentals, those folks would use the parking that's on site, but we can't, it would be very challenging to um, enforce short-term rental users parking on the street. I mean, essentially anybody could use the street space, right? So if, even if maybe if you have a single stack driveway and maybe you can fit three cars in it, you know, they may only want to put one in it because they don't want to keep moving cars and may choose to use the streets. And so that, that is challenging. That would be challenging if you had a regulation to enforce whether or not folks were using the street and they should be using, you know, so just not saying that, you know, we couldn't have a regulation on that, but just thinking through it, there are challenges with like, how do, how do we actually enforce that? And then having the, the, the staff time to do it. So, all right. That's what I have. Great. So, yeah. Um, just a quick comment. I, I, I agree with my peers. So we got to, you know, take this down another level. And um, a lot of these are tied to each other. Right. Yep. I mean, I think we've heard, you know, so much public comment now about noise and, mm -hmm. you know, and I thought to myself before this meeting, if, if I were to try and solve one problem, what would it be, right? And it seems yep. noise is the most consistent. But when you take that down a level, right, you start seeing that there's a correlation between noise and the number of people that are inside a home, whether they're visiting for the day or whatever, right? You mm -hmm. put 15, 20, and I know I see it across the street from my house. And garbage. 20, 25 people in that house, right? And all summer long, you're hearing this noise, right? Mm -hmm. And does that violate a noise statute not during the day do we get any privacy absolutely not and that's common i share because i'm hearing it from my neighbors almost every day when i talk to them and i hear it from my wife every day as well but um anyway so i just think we owe it to ourselves to kind of you know let's figure out what problem we're trying to solve and then start getting under and then if we if we have to restructure the regulations the city council approves it then let's look into what enforcement needs to be put in place to support that because mm -hmm. from where i sit up on the hill the path we're heading down is just not sustainable I mean, it's not garbage is the other one right i mean there should be a dumpster in some of these houses right i've counted six cans overflowing things like that i mean are there any regulations on how many cans you can put out right now no there, there's not so anyway um not that that's wrong, at least the garbage is going into cans, right? But I think these things all kind of tie to each other, right? Mm -hmm. So I think we owe it to ourselves, and this is really important information, but at some point in time to start breaking some of these problems down and having an open discussion. I think that's gonna lead actually to some of what we're gonna be doing next. Um, so Kyle and um, is gonna kind of walk us through taking um, the information we all provided, but really just what we've been hearing talk about. I and I think, Kyle, if you're willing to focus more on the opportunities, because I think we, we're we all pretty clear on sort of what the positives, I mean, there was great consistency in what's positive about SDRs, what the issues are. I think where there's really opportunity for us to capture and discuss now is what the opportunities. Um, so to what you were saying, Kevin, I think, Maybe we can really put the bulk of the time on that. Sure. Cool. Again, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I have the pleasure of having Emily Newman here with us. Um, she is just recently joined McKenna as a summer planning intern. Um, she is a graduate student at the University of Michigan. She is based out of our Kalamazoo office. So I did want to um, bring her along as well to get some firsthand experience with her and also to um, offer her opinions and insights as well, being a um, younger demographic, maybe you know into that area as well. Um, but also just to inform the task force that, you know, she may be coming through with the rest of the summer. Um, she will be with us throughout uh, up to August, I believe, and then periodically after that. But um, so you may see her occasionally here more often, but I wanted to introduce her here as well. Because um, what a great topic to talk about and as a planning student, I can get into it. As the chair has mentioned, um, our task here, we've already kind of talked about code enforcement analysis through the sheriff's department. Um, it's very helpful um, as well doing that um, strengths, um, part of our um, SWOT analysis, S-O-W-T, starts with strengths. We've already kind of heard over the past couple months or a couple meetings what the strengths are of that. 
as a group, though, moving forward, I don't know if we want to talk about any as a collective task force, what we find the strengths are. Otherwise, I'm happy to just continue to dig through um, your responses you provided, but I thought it might be germane to talk as a task force as well to kind of get a consensus to see what uh, others are thinking of. Otherwise, I am happy as a chair of matchroom to move on to opportunities. Um, I think we've also kind of already highlighted some weaknesses that should be discussed as well, but I don't want to disservice any um, thoughts or ideas by skipping through strengths and weaknesses first. So I leave that up to the task force if I would like to. Steve? Yeah, I think that one, I, since we, most people here have already given a lot of their suggestions on the positives and negatives and the opportunities, you can kind of summarize those. But as we are talking about weaknesses, right now we've been kind of focusing on the noise, the garbage, the trash. But the other thing I hear consistently out in the community is that the number of short-term rentals is affecting the community feel. And it's affecting affordable housing and it's affecting the ability of people to be able to buy into the city who want to live here with families. So even though we can make ordinances that can kind of talk about short-term rentals and noise, garbage, parking, we don't want to forget that there is a consistent group that do talk about those other things that are more of how do you address it? Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Point of discussion, we'd like and to and, 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 and I was just saying that when we were saying we're going to skip the weaknesses because we've already, talked yeah, yeah, that's a that's a really that. that's a good I want point. To make certain that there is some that we haven't discussed yet today that I hear consistently out in the field and that are listed in okay. some of the weaknesses or negatives. I think if we recapped it, there's sort of the you know, the garbage noise, those things, it is this, the loss of neighborhood and then the impact on um, sort of affordability um of neighborhoods it's and if maybe one of the the deliverables coming out of this meeting is if we can capture sort of redo a grid that kind of up levels in each of these categories um because i think all of that came out and if you guys could do that and then we can really focus now on what the opportunities are is everybody okay with that Absolutely. Okay, yes. cool. Yes, we expect a lot of the stuff is listed by each person. Yep. System. Yeah. And there were some great ideas. I mean, I was definitely with my highlighter on some of the stuff. Okay, Kyle, back to you. Sure. So in that case, then I think we'll move to um, opportunities here for the city of Saga Talk on short term rental. I think they will also kind of dovetail into some of our strengths that there is economic benefit to short term rental from that. It does bring tourists in, it does provide stimulus to the businesses downtown um but also there are a little bit weaknesses as we mentioned that you know then the housing stock is limited for those who'd like to make this a permanent home um so opportunity wise i would like to have this more as a discussion and not me give you just points i'd like to hear from the task force on this of what the consensus is and then we can continue from there from our side another opportunity as well is that you are being residents and interested parties to the city to visit not only for the beach as well but the downtown area you have a obviously high demand as ryan's mentioned with the amount of short-term rental applications he gets in so there's something driving that factor in the background of why we want residents want to come to saga Tech. so i'd like to focus in more on opportunities that the task force sees as well um, as a group uh, i know it's a lot to probably read through as well and then forget what is said so even if it is with a few consensus and that will help us as we move forward to kind of get a consensus of when we develop our survey questions later on um, to bring them back at next meeting kind of what to focus in on as a task force as a whole and not individual points if that makes sense and all that word trouble so what's your where do you want us to dive in now just I guess I'd like a, at asset you know we share an idea or an opportunity or so that's come up to you and then if we as a task force kind of consents or just continue to dialogue off of that you know um so start with that um you know another opportunity is that it keeps Ryan busy you're you're I mean hearing it's hard for you to hear sure. get, be heard no it keeps Ryan busy during the summer months for uh you know short-term rentals that's an opportunity for us sure. but <laughs> I think, I mean, so I'll, I'll get us started. I think, you know, one thing, um, Kevin, I mean, what several people have said is sort of a good neighbor policy seems like a, and it seems like it's kind of a no brainer. Um, I'm, I was intrigued with your idea and I, I didn't mean to 
offer for you to share your contract with everybody, but if you're willing to, but of having consistent, really seeing if there's a way to have consistent agreements with some teeth to them. I thought that was a, a fabulous idea. So we can maybe kind of go round robin and other things that have popped up. Um, I think a lot of us here uh, that are in the industry have similar contracts. And if we're willing to share those contracts, I think you'll find consistency amongst those contracts. Okay. Um, I think one, the other important part that we're kind of missing, and I think you're trying to come up with this too, is we, we tend to sit at the round table here and talk about the negatives. Um, and we talk about surveys and how many people filled out a survey. And I've always got this in the back of my head, you know, if you send out a thousand surveys and a hundred come back, what did the 900 think? Why did they not fill out a survey? Are they okay with it? Are they not okay with it? So I think we also got to focus on that aspect of it that either they don't care or they're fine with it, but we also got to make sure we put the positives in what we talk about and the positives in the surveys that we send out and the questions about positivity of it so that it's always not a negative. Absolutely. Aspect. Yep. And I think we can see that same thing with some of these rental agreements. There's positive sides to rental agreements as well as the negative sides. Like we want you to enjoy your stay. We want you to have fun. Here's coupons to go visit local businesses. Right. I mean, right. Ideas like that as well. So we look, we're looking at it as a whole. And I, I think that's kind of where you're, yeah, sure. what um, you're asking or going. Next. No, correct. So even um, as uh, Holly mentioned, um, a good neighbor policy, as Kevin brought up, two consistent agreements, those are opportunities as we move forward as a task force that we could look into. So it spurs off of maybe some of the not as pleasant comments, but also the positive aspects. So I would like exactly Sean, to kind of shift that dynamic into how do we turn this into an opportunity for Saga Talk? You know, how do we um, help enhance or elevate the short term rental so it is more of a positive impact for the community and not this negative side? Um, you know, at opportunity might be to revamp or revisit the um, refuse storage, uh, you know, ordinance that the city has, you know, to locate that. So maybe instead of having six cans out there, you're permitted three. And after that, you need a larger dumpster. Um, so it would also help kind of direct in our mind to what other provisions should be looked at as an opportunity to help make the community um, better for a second. So. Charles, have you ever seen any community that has a standard rental agreement that would have to be utilized by all STRs? Not yet in our research. Um, I've come across that. I know we've included in the packet some of the additional breakdown. It's something we can look into further. I'm just sure. curious, or else if you say they must have at least minimum items. Yeah, I would say that. You know, as opposed to a standard one, but if we decide it's got to be a good neighbor, it's got to have a contact card, it's, you know, certain things that you can list that has to be in either the short-term rental or and if there's an opportunity for people who don't go through the property management firms to kind of follow that consistent mm -hmm. language, and I don't know how that would work, but it would be worth exploring. I, I think. think if we could create a citywide good neighbor policy yeah. that yeah. every single rental unit must have, yeah. must post, yeah. um, that's one. I don't, I think that's an easy one that we could come up with. And, yep. you know, with the help of the rental agencies that already have them, but come up with a consistent citywide good neighbor policy that's posted. Um, the enforcement of quiet time between 11 p.m. and 7 a.m. If you have a rental unit that has outdoor space, whether that's an outdoor deck, an outdoor hot tub, an outdoor fire pit, maybe something listed outside that goes along with that about quiet time hours and you know and then the whole contact information so the police have a list of the contact person I love that call. idea yep um I just think those are some of the things that would be easy things for us to be very specific right that must be required with every single rental and that way it's all consistent yep agreed awesome. um, Sorry, also on our, the uh, rental application or rental certificate, there is a location on there that says, are you managing the, your, the south or do you have someone else managing it for you? And it does put, you have to put your name down. So we put down us and a phone number. So there is that in that information in there, um, you know, to have. But again, also, I know someone kind of was saying, well, it's not my responsibility, but if we go to neighbors with cards or this is who, the management company is or this is who the homeowner is or this is who manages it when you're when the one homeowner 
um, you know, isn't there um, to say, because it is, if you, if you want to protect this community and as much as everyone's saying, then we all have to take an active role and to say, well, that's not my job to pick up the phone and call if there's noise, because we can't fix it if we don't know about it. So I think that's an opportunity as well. Madam Chair, so on, on that note, I'll, I'll play a little bit of an advocate here for that. What is the temperament for the task force of looking at possibly making that a requirement within a city policy that um, any rental must provide that contact to every budding property around them? I think it's worth exploring. I mean, so make well, that part of your through all these opportunities. Most every person who applies talks about the good neighbor policy, talks mm -hmm. about that. Right. Yeah. And so if you get just like we're doing on the positive and negative, if you read through every one of the opportunities, you can almost break them down. As I'm reading through, there's six or seven that are consistent in every one of the ones who comment. And I think, I, oh, yeah. go ahead. Another, um, another thing that has come up with a lot of people, and I think probably would be a no-brainer is to make sure we capture our costs. I mean, the city right now is sort of underwriting short-term rentals. And so are we really capturing all of the costs of the fire department, all of the costs of Ryan and the staff that's working on it and really make sure that we are including overhead. I mean, what is the fully baked cost? Um, Madam Chair, on that note too, it's I have marked on that to follow up with Ryan um, outside of this meeting to, to determine more of the fees that we discussed earlier with the Sheriff's Department. Is that part of a zoning ordinance? Is that a civil infraction? Um, my experience with that, I don't want to speak out of turn for the Sheriff's Department, but doing enforcement on a zoning side, we would issue a civil infraction ticket. It would go to court. The court would then collect the fees. So I would ask then to look into what the process is for fee collection. Does it come right back to the city or does it go to the county court system as a collection? So that's just another item as we talked about, or as the task force talks about looking at the fees to see how those are structured to who actually at the end of the day would actually capture that back. Because if we talk about raising fees, and again, I don't want to talk about a turn for the city here um, in any regard, but who actually would capture that at the end of the day then too. Right. Yeah. And and what's great about having you on board and actually Ryan's experience in this too, is you guys know all of the ins and outs of that, that most of us wouldn't know. So one other opportunity before I forget that I want to get, and actually Lauren, it was something you said at a city council meeting eons ago, but are there ways, and this would be probably a longer term thing, but are there ways for us to encourage more people to move here full time? I mean, one way to get, you know, the neighborhood feel back in the neighborhoods is to get more neighbors. Um, so we can kind of put that as something to think about. It was a question that I had. Are there any communities that you've dealt with that have incentives for people to live here full time? I mean, obviously, we live in a pretty amazing place and we're lucky, um, but I don't know if there's anything when it comes to, um, you know, taxes or anything like that. If there's any incentives out there, any positives that could help there, people to want to live here full time because our taxes are so high. Um, is there anything that could be done to encourage people to live here full time? And this is something I can um, we can work with Ryan further on, but I know some communities that qualify through the U.S. Um, HUD, uh, Housing and Urban Development Department. It's called the Community, Community Development Block Grant. Um, they used to have programs that I don't know since 2020 what's shifted on that and where federal funding is, but prior to that, communities could apply or receive um, CDBG is the acronym funding. And in some of that, they would offer um, first-time homeowner um, down payment assistance as well, or even um, rehab grants. So there is some funding mechanism out there but to move in um, as a tax instead of that's above my level right now, I can tell you, Lauren, I just know that there are some programs out there that would help um, first time home buyers dependent on income qualification. Yeah, as well. I'm guessing none of our homes would qualify in the <laughs> South Tech area. But, but it is good. It is good to look into, though, to know, like, you know, would the city qualify for that? Those types of programs um, as well through a federal program. So, yeah. Yeah, for sure. See? Absolutely. I'm sure one of the things that I had put that in the opportunity, I don't know if everybody on the task force is aware, but when we're discussing resources and we, which kind of relates back to fees and how much fees we need to, to generate, you know, I guess one of the topics we'll need to discuss would be do we want additional resources like as employees in the city? Or I don't know if you're aware that there are companies in the around the country that manage short-term rentals for municipalities. Like one of them is Granicus that I know I've had contact with, I think some other people in the room, where they fully manage the entire operation. Like they do it for over 53 cities in West Michigan. 
and they, they manage the short-term rental applications, they manage the collection fees, they manage the violation fines, they monitor the websites you know, to try to identify if anybody doesn't have short-term rentals. Now, again, it's something that you know, we want to operate it as a, you know, hiring a third party. But before we started, you know, that's one thing I'd like to have out on the table, you know, because if people aren't aware of it, you can kind of take a look. And that there's probably other companies besides Granicus. That just happens to be the largest one that has a full-time uh, staff that does nothing but manage short-term rentals for the cities. We got a quote uh, during one of our initial webinars before we ever formed the task force. And they had estimated for a city of size to up with our number of rentals, it might be twenty or $25,000 a year for them to be able to provide the full services, which you could raise that by changing the you know, fees very limited. So as we're kind of thinking about um, whether or not it's resources, because it is a huge amount of resources on our city uh, staff. Steve, what city did that? No, right now I can give you the list. I have a list of the 53 cities. Yeah. They do 300 and some currently across the country. Their largest one is like Nashville, uh, but, but a lot of the ones in West Michigan are smaller towns. Okay. And some of them they are providing. And again, I'm only talking about one because I, from what I understand there are others, but on the one, they will provide a level of service. So like you can hire them just to do a scan of all rental websites and try to help, like say Ryan, identify any ones that are renting that don't have licenses. So you give them all the ones that you currently have, and then they'll do a lot of the search. There's a fee for that. If you want them to manage the whole short-term rental where they will send out the application, um, they'll you know, you know, they return the application back, they issue the license. If you want them to then go into that level of where there's violations, they'll be the ones responsible to kind of collect. So kind of, they, if you package it all, that's where you come up with that higher level, but there's like four levels of the different services. And I can definitely send it over to Holly or I can send it to Ryan, he can send it out um, to everyone. But I think that's something that we also may want to be looking at and kind of considering, um, especially given our tightness of space in City Hall and whether or not we can you know, have another employee or if you just wanted something like that. Before I, I want to be sure we leave time for the comments at the end. Um, other opportunities we want to capture in this meeting? I'm sorry, can we just recap what we've already put on the table so far? Are your notes such that you can do that, Kyle? If not, I'm hoping Emily's are. Um, <laughs> yes, uh, so good neighbor policy, look at citywide. That's what I've captured as well. Um, consistent agreements comes across that. That was again from Kevin. Um, I also kind of just again circled reduced noise, and that just for me is on this is um, maybe looking at revamping the noise ordinance um, through the city, and that's based on feedback from the sheriffs. But that's more of a Ryan and I thing, and looking at that. Um, Lauren's question to um, payment assistance for you know home buyers to make it more of a permanent home on here is potential opportunity. And then third party rental inspections as well, um, looking at a company from there. And then we'll also go through um, your individual responses as well and try to condense down a few different ones. I think Lauren had also mentioned sort of a citywide policy so that the Airbnbs and others are affected by that too. Um, contact cards, contact yeah. information. Contact yeah. uh, police. Something came up, maybe it was Kevin in the last, forget who it was. I know I put it in one of my comments. I was just curious. Certain STRs, if they have a, over a certain level, are required to be part of the Convention Bureau. Is that correct? Yes. And then, you know, but why are we allowing any of the STRs to kind of operate without being part of? Well, the convention you're only getting that five percent usage mission. Oh, oh, yeah, that would uh, that's an Ashley thing again. <laughs> um, I believe actually, yeah, 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 you were required to rep, you had to have at least 10 properties in your portfolio to be part of the CVB, correct, Ashley? <clears throat> yes, technically, our. Um, you have you have if you have ten or more properties, you're required to be a member of the CVB and collect a five percent. Um, there have been instances in the past where our board has allowed a member to join with less than ten. Um, and just to clarify what that ten means, it could be a bed and breakfast with ten rooms, or a hotel with ten rooms, or a vacation rental management company with ten properties. Ashley, is there a reason why um, it? 
let's say someone has one or two properties here in town um, and it's self-managed, is there a reason why they're not, um, <clears throat> I'm not saying forced, but obligated to be a part of the CVB and buy, yeah, yeah, collect the five. Collect the five um, I, I'm just going to guess on that. Um, I would say because as a CVB member, you have voting rights and you get one vote, no matter how big or small your company is. So that's probably to protect um, that. Um, so say for Bella Vida, who has a lot more properties than a smaller company, um, shouldn't necessarily have the same say in those decisions. And, you know, just to clarify, so everybody knows, um, the Convention and Visitors Bureau, they advertise nice, and they, they yeah. you know, put those on their website, they do all of those things. Somebody that only has one or two, they're just not going to be advertised. Right. So they don't get all the, you know, the great things that the CBB does for our community. They will benefit to some extent. They, yeah, just, they benefit you know, on their but, own, but. But yeah. that 5%, a um, credit to the CVB, especially with the more recent regime in the last couple of years have done a really good job of spending our marketing dollars and bringing people to our town. Um, Thank you. And so that's where that's going. Well, I'm just thinking of the standpoint, this came up at one of the city council meetings recently, you know, just the overall cost of some of our special events, like say fireworks or Venetian nights, that's a huge draw of tourism and the vacation rental business benefits, you know, from it. But are they paying in any fees to help the city offset some of those costs? It's not just the citizens that really enjoy it. When we have a thousand people in town, you got 15,000 show up for the fireworks. So I mean, so part of the things I was looking at is opportunities that I'd like for us to try to figure out if we can do legally is how do we possibly capture, you know, and one of the ideas they even threw out was would you require everyone who has a short-term rental to actually work with one of the property management companies that already has a CV, you know, Convention Bureau license, and they collect the 5% on every rental as opposed to allowing. Now, I've only seen a couple of communities try this across the country, but it is a item that could be up for discussion. Um, it's, it's, it's radical, but that's one way of you know, making certain we can yeah. maybe find so. another way to get some compensation from them that would similarly to CVB kind of fund the city stuff that brings them here. Mm. Another I, thing I sorry um, saw from you, Elizabeth, which I thought was interesting, maybe like an email that's set up. Um, it's an opportunity so that if someone wants, instead of calling the police, could go through the city of Saugatuck and email and saying, you know, I'm a neighbor here this is you know on this date or this date um no just don't say there's a bunch of people partying with noise but they could send an email where then it could be i know this additional time for whatever but um you know because i do think that's something that sometimes people don't want to say something or kind of are you know don't want to have to call the police but if it's something that's continually happening in a certain property they have a place to go um, to email the city to say, you know, this is what's happening next door. So I, I actually had a, to that point, website. I think, Peter, you might have sent it to me, but there's a city, I think it might be in South Carolina, that actually has a, it's almost like a button on the website that, you know, you hit it, you type in the address, it immediately alerts the owner and the city as well, so that whether you're a resident or a neighbor or whatever, you have an opportunity to very easily raise concerns without having to walk across the street or look through your, you know, if you're a neighbor and you've got seven of them around you, look through a bunch of cards or try and figure out who the contact person is. It's a very simple website, right? That allows you to, you know, very quickly contact the owner and the city for that matter, right? And just kind of also provides an audit trail, right? If you start having repeat issues, so. I think something like that would really be worth digging in and talking about. Steve? I have one other thing, if we're on the survey, since parking was one of the issues, I don't know because I don't live on this side of the river from up in the hill, but would the citizens be opposed to summer parking, zoning, um, like sticker parking, you know, on their streets where the homeowner gets a parking pass? And that's, you know, in the short term rental, only gets one pass, but if you park on the street during the summer months, you must have a parking pass. Um, I don't, you know, that would be would require some zoning changes, but it's a conversation for the parking issue. Kyle, do you have enough? I, so we've got left on the list the community comparison, the community engagement, and data analysis. And um, do you have enough? 
from this to get you what you need? Because uh, we can push some of this off, but I don't want to push. No, too much um, we off. do. And again, this is a big thank you to Ryan too for collecting all your responses and putting into a nice um, usable um, table for it as well. Um, my intent with this today before the task force was just to um, share these as a group idea. Yeah. Make sure there's a consensus. Um, I didn't want any one's ideas to be missed in any yep. capacity. If there's something that we felt strongly about or a member felt strongly about, I wanted that opportunity to share and then discuss further here just um, because you are a you know multi-body or multi-person body um, to ensure that I'm not missing anything within this. So that's why, cool. why I wanted to have that dialogue here. Well, and we'll get the sort of the input collected and, and organized so that people can provide additional feedback once we get. I mean, I, again, I think this is going to be a living document. Yes. Mm -hmm. I was just going to use that exact word, and 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 then your your public engagement process is going to inform right. this continued discussion uh, yep. as well. Um, okay, community comparison. So, um, based on the feedback we received um, from last meeting, we have um, revamped our community comparison tables in here, looking at the city of Charlevoix, city of Grand Haven, city of Saint Ignace and um, Sutton's Bay Township as well. Um, then to kind of more highlight, and this also brings into kind of the local comparisons as well, but to look at um, the housing units or short-term rental caps, if it's a zoning ordinance or if it's a general ordinance, um, tenant code of conduct, special parking requirements, occupant limits, definitions, um, registration items, and then penalties as well. So with that, I'm, I'm happy to dig into this a little bit more, otherwise, uh, maybe a benefit just to share um, with the task force and then maybe continue with this at a different meeting. Yeah, yeah one um, one thing that I think would be helpful to know, and you can, we can calculate it, assuming the cap represents in St. Ignace and, and Sutton's Bay, sort of the number they have, but I, I th I'd be curious to know what, how, what percentage of short-term rentals other communities have. Um, cause one of the questions that I keep wondering is I think we're close to 30%. We're between 25 and 30% is, is that high? Is it not high? And again, especially from communities that are like ours. Um, and if we need to go outside of Michigan, I mean, you know, what about Provincetown, Massachusetts or other, you know, seasonal tourism towns? I just think that would be really helpful data to have, um, and then, and Ryan, I think too, if, if maybe we can get your, you gave it to the planning commission a couple months ago of um, the number we have, but you broke it down by zone, which I think will help us as we look at opportunity to, to identify are there, I mean, I, from what I recall, some of, I mean, the Hill, for example, is a pretty dense in terms of number of STRs, but if we kind of look at the density of STRs, um, I think, I mean, again, it'll be good data whether we decide we have recommendations or thoughts from it. I think that would be helpful. Yeah, and I'll, I'll work with Kyle and his team to see if there's a easier method that they have than what I did last time and, and a pretty way to present that to you as well. Is there a way also to look at um, occupancy, you know, based on number of units that are limit of, four, you know, occupancy of four, occupancy of you know, six and higher. Um, we do have that data of like, yeah, we have that data available. So you're asking like how many units would have an occupancy of, yeah, six, how many may have an occupancy of eight, 10? 15, 20, yeah. Yep. Actually, and in line with that, I'd maybe direct the question to Kyle is, are any of these communities looking at the separation between defining what's a short-term rental versus what's a business. In other words, you, you take a home and you put 25 people in it, right? I mean, and I don't know if we have any that get up to that level, right? But I know that there's some that, I mean, I've seen 25 people and that's different whether or not there's, they're actually permitted for 25. But, you know, the question really is, are communities starting to look and say, okay, time out a second, we're enough's enough. 25 people, 10 people, I don't know, some some arbitrary number that says you're, you're really running a bed and breakfast here with no management in it or something along those lines, right? Because it's a question I get asked. It's a question I ask myself, you know, from time to time. And I'm just curious if 
you're seeing that in working with any of the other communities or or is it just completely out the window? So Joe, to part of your question, I would say this under that um, tab that we do define or those communities um, define short-term rentals definitions on there and what they consider that. Um, so I would say if it falls above that, we'd have to go back into their ordinances to determine is it like a home business? Is it regulated as a business? Are they even permitted? So it'd be more data analysis than what we have at present. I see. Okay. John, I think one thing that was, how you might have mentioned it in your SWOT analysis, but you also have it here. It kind of relates to what some communities are doing. You'll see where, where they're issuing two different types of short-term rental licenses, you know, ones that are considered like owner-occupied versus mm -hmm. non-owner-occupied. You know, there's a lot of cities that are looking at that. So again, if you have your home and you're only renting it for a couple of weeks of summer, but you're in it the rest of the time, it's an owner-occupied, which has a whole maybe different connotation than an LLC that owns a home and it fully is operating 52 weeks a year. You know, right. So, uh, so I am starting to see you know, in this list, but also some of the stuff I've seen across the country, more and more cities are looking at making you know, uh, regulations around the two different types of short term rentals. So it's not really a business, but you can potentially write your, your ordinances in such a way. Right. Yeah. The question kind of then ties to the next logical jump, which is what's allowed in residential versus non residential, right? Because there's an argument that it, R1, and in fact, yeah. I'm, I'm going to send you a document on one of these code of conducts that I reviewed when my neighbors sent me, Lou Wessel, and they specifically say in their code of contact and in the town regulations that you're in R1, your zoned residential single family. You can only have one family in a short-term rental. You cannot have multiple families. You cannot have parties, blah, 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 blah. And they break it down that far, separated by the fact that you're in that residential zone. So I'm just kind of was, that's kind of what was, it, it ticked something in my head, right? And I thought I'd bring it up and kind of see if the other communities were looking at it that way. Madam Chair, if I may. I do not believe it'd be a challenge for our team to look at these four communities and then pull what they consider permitted uses out of their ordinance. Mm. Those should be readily available to us as well. And then we can pull that back as probably just PDFs and, and send them to Ryan. Um, and then it would list out, you know, like city of Charlevoix, what they'd consider permitted uses and then they're in their residential districts, what they consider special uses. And then we can a little bit of extrapolation from that as well. Great. Thanks. Don't you think that's important? We'd learn what that is here too. I mean, because we have a lot of STRs in a commercial district, in a mixed use district, in a lodging district. Right. So when we think of 200 STRs, is there 50 of them in R1? Is there mm -hmm. 10 of them in here? Is the ship and shore considered an STR? I, I don't know. You know, mm -hmm. it's also what, Madam Chair, it's what you're actually looking. Someone was talking about um, like a homeowner that only rents it out a couple weeks. You know, a lot of as Kevin, I know sometimes I think you mentioned there's a set time frame really of big business in this community. And so, I mean, we have some homeowners that are here once a week, once a week, I mean, one full week every month. And then after that, they use the house for themselves. So it's like, how do you differentiate? So it'd be interesting to see, you know, what kind of guidelines it can get murky. Ryan, did you want to say something? No, I, I think the, the Sean's point, uh, I think that's the what um, Chair Anderson's kind of looking at. Like when you, when we break down how many there are, uh, you'll see that by zoning district. And, and we'll make sure that you understand the designations of whether or not they're residential zoning districts. It's helpful to look districts. at. Yep. Kyle, I have a question regarding back to the STR cap. And mm -hmm. let me preface this by, even though what I do for a living, I by no means think every property should be a, a vacation rental. Um, we turn more down than we take, to be honest with you. But if I'm playing devil's advocate, what, like, what's been your experience with the legalities of these caps? Like how come this neighbor can rent their place? But if we're saying, saying, Dignus, I'm the 51st person I, and there's only a 50 cap is like, is that 
Is that legal? Can you, can you, I am going it? to straight up defer to the city attorney on that one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, do, I, mean, I do not, I can answer from a zoning standpoint, but I do not want to answer from a legal standpoint. I mean, I, and Mr. Woody is on the call, Madam Chair, if you want to. Yeah, Mr. Woody, will you? Uh, yeah, I, th there is legal precedent um, for limiting those kinds of land uses. Uh, that is something that uh, occasionally in our, our work for other municipalities, we've actually seen applied to short term rentals. Um, but then outside of that specific use, um, you know, that's also something you'd see for other different types of licensed businesses. Uh, so, for example, uh, you know, medical and recreational marijuana, that's another example of a land use where it's, it's highly regulated and licensed. And most municipalities that allow that within their jurisdiction limit it to a certain number of licenses that are issued. Um, so a, a, a cap, I mean, it, it's something that would need to be data-driven, um, and often there are, you know, factors that can inform a cap, um, but it is, it, I guess, generally speaking, something that would be defensible. Indefensible. It would be defensible. Indefensible. Okay. Yes. I mean, I, I go back to, there was a, a gentleman who was trying to sell his home, um, and at the time, the moratorium was still on. And he's got runners all rentals all around him. So there wasn't a moratorium. There was a, yeah, there, there never was. was. No, there never was. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. If there was one, if there was one, or yeah. if there was a cap, my story. Yeah, sorry. Um, but he has lost that pool of people to purchase his home who may have wanted it as an investment property. Is that fair to that homeowner? Is is my question. You know, just that's just the, another side of this. Yeah, I, and playing the devil's advocate, I think any investment has risks. So, I mean- Right, but yeah, neighbors I, all have, are all rentals. He's not, he's, right. he's a full-time resident, but he wants to just move for whatever reason. But- I, I could make a counter argument that the pool, depending on the density of short-term rentals around the house, the pool of buyers, who aren't short-term rentals is limited because they may not want to go into a neighborhood like that. Honestly, I'll never ever move into a neighborhood that's congested with short-term rentals. Again, if I have to move, it's going to be somewhere far away. Nice. So know, in the interest of time, because I, I this is a really, really important discussion and I think we need to devote time to it. Um, if we decide as we move along that we want to discuss, I mean, that a discussion of a cap is on the table, then I think we really need to focus a, a robust discussion, looking at all the different angles. And I don't think in the next 25 minutes, we're going to do that justice. Um, but it's really an important, I think it's a really important topic. And as we saw with the proposed moratorium on new licenses, um, it's it's very complex and people have much to lose and people have much to gain and and so we wanted i think devote the right amount of time to that unless i mean if people you know i think we okay cool and it could be part of a survey or public public forums yeah. yeah i mean i i think if we get if we put that on the table to discuss we need to be sure that we're really devoting the time and attention to it Great. Then, Madam Chair, if you don't mind, I will move into community engagement. Um, this has been brought up um, in discussions with city staff and the um, task force chair. As we move into the summer months, um, we understand that public engagement is going to be a big key factor. Um, there's a further our understanding that we have a very short window of time frame to collect that and to also continue our dialogues here. So this is why um, at our request, we did ask Ryan to place this on the agenda to discuss the types of community engagement that the task force would like to, if there is any, uh, make recommendations to council for. Again, I mean, we're already, it's June 1st already, believe it or not. Um, I, I woke up and I didn't realize it was already June, um, that kind of deal. You know, when so September looks a lot closer now that it's June than it did in May um, in that regard. So with this, we do have a few different styles of community engagement we can look at. Um, there's outreach and branding where we could make a uh, website or a landing page that residents and stakeholders could go to. We could do flyers, postcards, and then signage. That's a type of outreach and branding we can do. Um, if we did a website, it could also be a its own design to include, you know, Saga Talk short-term rental, you know, task force. There'd be some brand of itself with that. 
Community workshops, um, McKenna is big on public engagement and big on public input. Um, we offer, we do different types of open houses, which could be a two hour session where we ask the community to come in and share their ideas, similar to the strengths and weaknesses that we discussed earlier. We can place maps up in rooms and ask residents, you know, where do they think there are concerns? There's different avenues for that. We can do small group settings as well, maybe the business corridor of the city, uh, pop-up engagements, festivals, and gatherings. Um, we're happy to attend festivals. Um, however, if we do get a draw of interested party members, we'll say that could impact your data results to an extent. But again, that we leave up to the task force if they feel it'd be a benefit for uh, festivals or gatherings. What other ones? Um, targeted outreach meetings. We could do similar to um, key components such as our um, vacation rental organizations or and same thing with um, stakeholder interviews as well. So at this point, um, with Ryan's permission, I think we're looking for some discussion and direction from the task force of what needs to move forward with that for public outreach. I'm going to ask. The, yeah, oh, go ahead. The caveat that yeah. it's. Um, there's a cost to each one of these things that are in addition to our contract that we have right. with McKenna. And I have to take any of your suggestions back to the city council to get their approval for funding. So the, the cost for each of these items are in your packet. So you're aware of that. I said, we'll take whatever recommendation you have to the council, but ultimately it would be up to them and what they're willing to fund. So great. And oh, go ahead. Brian, in regards to that, if we as a task force said that we were willing to sponsor the open houses or to be at a booth or a festival or a gathering, does that involve an additional cost from McKenna or only if McKenna is the one who's conducting it? That's a good question for Kyle. It would only be if we were conducting it and spearheading it. Um, that's you know our kind of position as well as the facilitators. That way you as residents um, can take a step back. Um, you are we more than encourage planning commission members, council members of communities we work with to attend and participate. However, um, when we act as facilitators, that helps you kind of um, to in some extent disengage if you'd like, but or being engaged in itself. Um, it also takes a pressure off of the municipal leaders or even board members from having to attend and staff that as well. Um, so that's up to their discretion as well. But this would be if we were to host it. This means that we prepare all the uh, materials as well for the open houses or anything like that. That'll be all on us and nothing the task force would have to then establish as well. Great. Thanks. Lauren, I'm going to start with you because I know you need to leave soon um, in terms of thoughts on engagement. No, I think we've had plenty of engagement. I feel like everybody has had their say. I, I, I think it's been well attended. I think people have come in person. They've joined on Zoom. We've heard the same thing over and over and over again, both positive and negative. I'm good. Like, I feel like we have a really, there's some things that we need to know. We need to know about our zones, you know, our different residential zones. I think, you know, we need to have a better idea of, you know, what it looks like. Cause it's like, we're zo we have so many zones in our, you know, in our town. We know this, right? Um, that's part of it that I, we would like to have a better understanding of that what that looks like. Um, I also want just some data from some other communities outside of what we've seen so far, because I feel like nothing looks different. Um, I, you know, I'm kind of looking for maybe some places out of state, you know, maybe like some, you know, so, some towns in Florida, um, some different places that might have seen their neighborhoods disappear and what that looks like and what they're doing now. Um, I'm just looking for some you know, out of the box ideas, because I feel like we're kind of talking in circles too much. Okay. Madam Chair, also, um, South Haven was one that I had talked about because they did just go through all this. So they did increase fines. They did put like a lottery on how many short term rentals. Um, they made all these things that, uh, you know, um, the certificate has to be displayed in the window, that there is a good neighbor noise policy that is promoted throughout the community. So I think, you know, I mean, I know we're different, even though we're 15 minutes away, we're very different, but at the same time, they've just kind of, this is what they've been working on for the last two years and have come to some type of resolution, you know? So I think that might be a good community as well. And Kyla, if you could, one thing that's going off what Lauren just said, I don't know if somebody could tell us, has there been any community that instituted it three to five years ago? I don't know when this all started, but let's say somebody had a policy that would, 
was put in place five years ago, has it had a positive or negative impact on them? Because many of these communities like us are just now doing it within the last 12 or 24 months and it might take longer, but if we could find a community that's actually had it in place four or five years or more, that would possibly be an interesting data point for us. Uh, one, one more thing, Madam Chair, just also I think maybe it might be behoove us to keep come maybe every couple of weeks, just put something in the commercial record that people are encouraged to attend these meetings, that this is still going on. I think, you know, that there's a whole hoopla of the task force, and then it's kind of like we haven't heard much about it. So maybe just as, you know, ongoing encouragement, that could be our community outreach. <laughs> it's kind of great idea. Yeah. <clears throat> Again, I'd like, I'd just like to say something like, I think I'm on the same page with you on this. Can you get closer to your mic? I'm sorry. Um, I think I'm on the same page with Lauren on this. Again, what I'm hearing is what we got to do to solve problems. And I think as a task force, we have to make sure that we have policies in place so we don't have a problem. We're talking about there's going to be a problem. Let's send a fine. There's going to be a problem. Let's give them a ticket. There's going to be a problem, problem, problem. I think we got to make sure that our STR is strong and we have consistency and we understand what it is and we make it so we don't have a problem. So we don't ever have to write a fine. We don't ever have to do this. Our communities are friendly. Our neighbors are friendly. We, we understand what it is. And I think what I hear is a lot of people don't really understand what it is but they understand that there's problems. So uh, we got to flip back to the top of what our core is of what we're trying to do here is prevent a problem instead of what are we going to do when there is. Mm -hmm. And I think because all I hear is we're going to do a fee, we're going to do this, and we're going to charge more for this, and we're going to hire another person for this. And it just seems to be cumbersome to me to have so much of what are we going to do if there's a problem. Okay. And I just, I wanted to just say that too, because these are all great, but we, we've heard so much already, and this just seems like a lot of paperwork when we already kind of understand what we're trying to do here. How do you feel, though, about a, a citywide survey or something so that people who don't make it to these meetings, and this has come up at the, at the Planning Commission meetings, is to make sure that we're getting beyond the, you know, 50 people who I think have been pretty regularly engaged in this process, and I'm making up 50, but might be 30, um, but getting some data from everybody who lives in Saga talk about, you know, where, what their thoughts are about short-term rentals. Um, well, again, I think it goes back to, you can send out a survey. Got it. And you're going to have a few people, but I think it's important that the people who do say what the issues are, we, we, we try to solve it so that there's not a problem. Um, I would love everyone to come by and say, we don't have a problem, but no matter what it is, whether it's STRs or the fireworks or the beer tents or whatever, there's always, always things that you have. So yeah. um, I just, you know, I, I just think it's important that we try to resolve the issues before it's an issue. Absolutely. Because I, I I think that's the driver for me of why I, I mean, decided that's to be really here. sort of the purpose of this committee is to, mm -hmm. you know, figure out what we can be doing so that people aren't kvetching. I, I agree with Sean. I think you can't fix a problem unless you know what the problem is. So I mean, we've gotten enough information now that we know there are concerns out there and we should probably, and I'm encouraged to hear that we're going to take the time to kind of drill down and come up with recommendations that you know, be granular enough that we can act on them in terms of the community engagement. Uh, I agree a little bit with Lori here. I think if we are going to focus, you know, energy and time on further outreach, it should be in the development of a survey. And then just to val that would be just to validate what we've been hearing around the, the problems that we have. That's just my own opinion. But I mean, I like the, the local observer. It doesn't cost much to do that. Um, it, 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 it just lets more people. Commercial you talking about? Oh yeah, observer isn't around anymore. <laughs> um, <laughs> what task person you are? <laughs> but uh, you know, again, the more people that can come and give their opinions, positive and negative, yeah. help. So if that's one spot that we're lacking on, 
I don't think you're going to find a bunch of people that want to talk about this at a, an event, an, okay. art, an art festival, the 4th of yeah. July parade. I think that's kind of a waste of money. I think we got to try to find a way to get out in front of them. Maybe the city website can have the button like. the button that says, give us your opinion of what you think, anonymously. Or idea too. And it's simple to do. <laughs> that um, and that, that could give us some more information. I mean, if we get 10 more people that, that come up with different ideas would be great, but I bet you 10 more people would come up with the same thing that we're kind of already dealing with. And I'm sure Lauren will probably agree. And anybody, many people in this room were part of planning commission as well as city hall meetings that all took place earlier this year when we were discussing whether or not we would need a moratorium while we're looking at this. And I can tell you that when I read, when I read through all the comments that we've all written here as the positives, the negatives, the opportunities, those were mentioned numerous times by individuals during those open meetings that we went back. So I kind of, you know, I almost fall in a camp like Lauren right now where I'm thinking, haven't we heard probably from everybody who's really going to express, you know, I can almost walk, watch somebody come up to the microphone because I've heard them before. I'm going to have an idea as to what they're going to be saying. You know, so I think it's probably important that we maybe do something so that people don't think as a task force, we didn't involve them. But realistically, we've been involving them since March when this whole thing first started. So, Kyle, maybe you guys can come back with a recommendation, having heard, you know, opinions. I, I would, I would, I think we need to do some sort of a mass outreach to to just so we can say, I mean, just to give people who haven't been here or find some way, maybe it's a town hall meeting and, and we do different times of day, but come back with some recommendations knowing we don't want to reinvent. We don't need to go to, I mean, I think we all know we don't need to overdo this. Quick question. Do we need the, do we need approval from the city to put the small article in the commercial record? No, I mean, I no, know. Yeah, I think that's an expense behind it, right? Presumably. Yeah, but I mean, that's something that, that we could look into. I mean, I, I think, you know, we'll discuss, I think Cal can come back with, based on what the chair's indicated, you know, should it be like a chase and say, make a motion to do it? I mean, it's a great idea. I yeah, think everybody's in favor of it. Uh, yep. Yeah. One thing I'm wondering, like if we were going to do a town hall, if we actually had so, you know, Kyle puts this whole thing together. We've listed out the positives and negatives, some of the opportunities. We just said that gets sent with the survey or if you're doing a town hall. And then if somebody wants to get up and speak, if they start talking about something that's already in that listing, we can say, note it. It's the item number five underneath. Yep. Because what ends up happening is you get people to get up and they keep saying the same thing. Yep. But if we've already got it listed out and we say, okay, here's all the things that are being discussed at the task force level. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Yep as opposed to just having a town hall with allowing people to, because we'll get the same comments over and over. Yeah, I, yeah. I personally don't think there's much more. I think we've covered. I, don't, I, I, just, I, I, I agree. I, I just think we need, I think people need to feel like they've had a chance to they, contribute and, or not. So well, how about just to move this along, Kyle, come back with a recommendation. We'll make a decision next week. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, we're, I think we're talking about three, three buckets, the compliance of, the person managing the property or the home or the homeowner, the ramifications and the cap. I want to ramifications, whether that's a, a, um, a, a penalty or some type of thing on the manager or the owner or the renter. And then the whole other side of it is what I brought up earlier is just about, you know, do we have a cap based on our population and where it's at and so forth. That's it. Those are the three things we're talking about. Great. Um, quickly, is there data, and maybe we can do this by email, if there's data uh, or just spend no more than like three minutes on any data that we, and I know we've talked about getting to some other communities, looking at other, you know, uh, communities that have been through this for a few years. Um, the other thing I would love is, is there's any data on it, what percentage of short-term rentals communities tend to lose their sense of community. Um, and if we could find that, I think that would be really helpful. Quickly, anything else here? And then we need to get to, I think, public comment. Yeah, just to expand on that a little, if I could, Madam Chair, I, I think we're, uh, Kyle and his team and, and myself, we're really 
hoping that the task force, I, I don't know if you've, if you've all had a chance to look at the supplemental material yet of, if, you know, based on everything that you've discussed so far, and we've discussed some of the additional data that you're looking for um, on a more granular level or, you know, occupancy level, you know, number of units with occupancy and by zoning district and, and additional things from maybe from other communities. Are there any other larger studies that you're looking for? Like some people have brought up that they really think that, you know, like maybe a, a greater, some kind of greater economic analysis would be um, informative for the task force in evaluating short-term rentals. Maybe, especially if maybe you're looking at um, density or how many that you have and whether or not you're, you're at a tipping point or something like that. Those types of things can be done, but again, there's a cost to it. And so we want to make sure and take that back to the city council to get those things approved so that Kyle and his team can also start gathering that data. Yeah. Um, so we're not in a position where we're a few months down the road and then somebody's like, well, how can we even look into this? And then we're at the point where, well, we're kind of starting to work on recommendations now. So. Yeah. I have a couple of things to add. Uh, just the trends in housing costs over the past five years in Saugatuck, I think would be helpful. Um, and if there's any way and I don't know that this is possible to tie increases in housing costs to short-term rentals. I think it's, I don't know that we can draw causality from it. It might be correlation, but I think that would be helpful. I think if we just compare it to the national averages for housing inflation, it's going to tell you something there. Okay. Right. I think um, changes in stats of the, in the numbers of full-term residents in the past five years. Um, uh I think it would be interesting to see if there's data on non-CAP related um, things communities have done to slow the growth without, you know, I mean, I don't think any of us want to tank the market, but are there ways to more organically slow growth? Um, I think helping us understand where the extra mill, like how much money does the city get from the extra mills we get? Um, and where that goes um, and trends sort of in that revenue. And then- um, That's a lot to get done by the next week. Well, and I mean, I'm just throwing these out and some of it, it might not be feasible, but I do think knowing more sort of a, about the economic mm -hmm. impact would be helpful. And I, I wouldn't expect we would have this in the next meeting. Yeah, and I don't think we're asking you to identify what data we'll have available at the next meeting, but what needs to be studied right? and, and additional dollars that we needed to fund and it, knowing that it, it'll take some time to gather that data. So can, can McKenna, he's taking notes down. Can he send us something back saying, this is what I heard you guys talk about. Here are some of the things, here's how we could group this or package this up together. This could be effective doing this this way, or this could be effective doing this yeah. way. We started listing yeah. down on 56 and 57 of your packets, the down analysis. Yeah. Um, it, we kept it in the summaries broad enough because we didn't at that time when we put this together, understand what would be in there. But some of this does hit on Holly's points as well, the housing market analysis, where that's at. And this would be then more refined with Ryan in the task force of what you're looking for, but... Um, because this would be a separate standalone than what we've initially discussed, like Ryan said, so. So Ryan, does it make sense to you to come back with, I mean, it might be a blend of some of these um, into a different, does that work for you? Yeah, and let's, if there's any other items that the task force wants us to look at and evaluating what the cost of that would be, please let us know now or email me. Uh, maybe in the next you know few days um and then i'll work with we'll work together to bring back maybe a final okay and if, this if, is outside of the scope this is gonna yep and if some stuff kyle it's like yeah it, it, that's just you know you can't really figure that out or to figure that out would cost you know yeah. let us know i mean we don't want to um, well no and go crazy two to i know lauren left but our point too th this is not uh, and i like the preferences too with the task force this is not for McKenna in any way to make additional funding. This is be not knowing what the task force would be looking for. That's why a lot of these options were presented separately, especially because we wanted to be cognizant of any kind of cost the city would incur by going this route. So these funds up here were requested, um, and this is more for the task force board as well, um, as a separate standalone, not knowing what the temperament would be 
Um, otherwise, we could have thrown together like a fifty thousand dollar plan, you know, kind of right. deal and said we'll do all this, but not knowing what the task force would like to look into, what council might look want to look into, what planning commission would like to look into. That's why this document is a standalone yep. itself, so we could then work with you as a task force members and then kind of refine it as you're asking us to do. That Great. Way. So that's also why this is up here too, and why it's not really listed in that initial scope. Awesome. We didn't know what would be. Yeah. Listed no. Okay. Yeah. Initially, it's great, and it was helpful. Mm -hmm um okay can we holly just to recap yep. i have trends in housing costs um you've asked for um kind of tax allocation as well where that goes that's more of a us and ryan thing, right working with the assessor and then knowing where that funding is so that might be a little bit kind of outside of our scope um any other trends data analysis that the task force would like us to look into i think you kind of talked about changes in um, full-time versus part-time residents yep. trends over time, how that's changed. And so that might be just you know, yeah, and population I can, I, data. Yeah. I think that would be helpful. Um, and yeah, the, the mill revenue, but I think that probably comes from the city. Yeah. Any others from the task force? And I'm, I'll give this to you. Cool. <laughs> okay. Um, great. We ready to call us. Kyle, is that enough for you for now? Yeah, I mean, but now cool? um, we'll coordinate with Ryan too after awesome. to make sure that we're encapsulating everything that's been asked. So cool. Um, you can tell I'm kind of trying to wrap this up. Um, so in terms of correspondence, I think everybody saw Dan Fox's email and the writers whose handwriting was impossible to read, but the with the article on um, on people, you know, Michigan population. Um, and with that, let's get to the second public comment. And this public comment can be about anything. Three minutes and we'll start in the room. Diana Docker, Elizabeth. Great. Um, regarding, um, oh, there's several votes here. The fire department um, is awesome. Uh, I mean, the inspector, I, uh, I feel they do a very good job. Um, I have my rental certificate here um, and they do put on their certificate here, the amount of people that you're allowed on the certificate. Um, and then your phone number is on there and everything like that. So the police could easily have this information, how many are supposed to be in the home, their phone number. Um, when I was, when you were flipping through the slides, I saw regarding the fire code, um, first violation, second violation, third violation. I was just curious on why we're letting someone rent their home if they're not following the, you know, the fire code. Um, and, and the fees, um, regarding that. Uh, regarding um, the home, the Michigan, some states have passed bills regarding housing uh, for workers, um, your police, your firemen to live in your community. So some states have already passed bills for down payment assistance. Your loans would be interest-free. So on like that, Michigan doesn't have that yet. Um, re and then regarding the one home, uh, the gentleman was selling his home. Uh, so to that home, so to a permanent resident, not as a vacation rental. On the one gentleman that was concerned about that. And the extra meals, I know you made a comment regarding the extra meals um, for non-homestead homestead. Um, the school gets that portion. So homestead, so much, the non-homestead, that portion goes to the school for funding. I'm just because I used to be a township treasurer. Um, that's where I know that part. <laughs> um, and uh, let's see here, the phone, sorry, um, citations. So regarding um, the police, they're just awesome. Um, I, I've had to call several times for 911. Um, guy yelling. I couldn't, I was, I couldn't tell where he was you know, yelling from. And the wind, and so they came right away. The police came right away. Another time I heard screaming and they were, took someone out of the van and was beating them up and beating her up. And so I called the police 
and explain the police wasn't, you know, we get a section car in certain times. We don't have full-time police all the time. So um, I'm sorry, is that my- Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Suresh from 647 Butler Street. And Steve, I promise this is going to blow your mind. It's not going to be the same thing I've said for the last few minutes. <laughs> so a um, couple of quick comments. Um, I applied to be in the task force as well, but um, did not make it. But I, I'm, I'm using use this opportunity to make me make some recommendations as well. So um, again, great conversation and great comment commentary. Um, I, we run our short-term rental ourselves. We don't run it through an agency, but we've adopted a lot of the similar policies that you have all spoken about, which I think is great uh, for people to have. Um, we don't allow anyone over 25. I'm sorry, you might not make the cut. Um, no, no parties. Uh, no, you, we have very strict parking regulations. We have two parking spots available on our property. And we say there's only two parking spots available and you have to make sure you park in the parking pad available. And we have a, a six people that are allowed in our, uh, in our rental, which we mandate that they're only allowed six people as well. Now we do that because we want to protect our property. We find we, you know, we we love coming there. We take great pride in ownership. So I don't want to have a few bad apples that aren't taking pride of ownership of their properties. Have you know lots of rules and regulations that impact eighty percent that are doing a great job of managing their rentals, either through an agency or either through self managed funds as well. Um, we also do have um, rules and regulations in relation to what needs to be posted inside the property the phone numbers of the contacting party, um, emergency instructions. So we've got we've actually got an extra step and we've put something in our window um, that uh, advises who to call, should there be a neighbor or should there be somebody that needs to get in touch with somebody? And maybe that's a recommendation that we have for all um, regulations moving forward. Another idea that I thought might be good is maybe there's um, some type of a rule that is on the city of Sorgatuck website that lists the short-term rentals that has the owner and the contact information available um, as well. So that if somebody doesn't want to trespass onto somebody's property, they can go into a website and have a look who they can contact as well immediately. Everyone's got access to the web. I do also love the idea of this policy that we have as the city of Sogatuck. Again, I think of it kind of like a HOA policy um, where people have to follow certain rules. My only request is it shouldn't only be short-term rental owners that need to follow those policies. It should be everybody that lives in the city of Sogatuck that needs to follow those policies, whether it be around noise, whether it be around garbage, whether it be around maintaining their property appropriately. It shouldn't just be a short-term rental owner that has to abide by those properties. It should be everybody that lives in the city of Sogatuck. Um, that's all I wanted to share. Thank you. Great, thanks. Uh, my name is Michael Economist. I live at Sidman 16 Park Street. A uh, couple of things. I want to make sure that uh, you heard my comments to the city council that the city of Saugatog in the last 10 years has lost 20% of its total population. Check it out if you haven't. That's significant and it brings great changes to our city. I'm not against short-term rentals, but I think they should be capped. Uh, I think, and maybe they should be uh, tied in with the number of non-permanent residents that we have here. I happen to live on the west side of the river on Mount Bald Head. I am surrounded circally by four homes. One of them is a short-term rental and three of them are rental. Uh, uh, one of them is a, a summer home and the other three are short-term rentals. I don't have any sense of neighborhood living around here, uh, but that's okay. I still love the city. Uh, but our problems are unique because we live on wooded lots. And uh, my neighbors don't clean up their yard in the fall. It's full of leaves. I like to keep my yard clean, but uh, I can't because the leaves blow over from my neighbor's homes onto me. I don't know what to do about it. 
uh, I guess I can. I don't even know who the owners are. In some cases, they're out of town. Uh, uh, two of them do come and spend some time in their rental properties. Uh, we had a case last week, uh, something unusual. Uh, I, I guess the parents had left and left their kids, uh, teenagers in, in the house. And my wife was looking out our kitchen window and here was a teenager carrying a box full of bottle, uh, bottles. She could hear him rattling and he came to put it underneath one of our bushes. <laughs> you know, you don't know what kind of problems you're going to have, but uh, you can't do away, away with them, but you can certainly limit them. But I'm really concerned about this population problem dropping. Uh, if, if we take another 20% down, we're down to 771 residents, according to uh, uh, j just from, we're down from the 2020 census to some more posted on, on the internet that I saw uh, the population. When I asked for the population of Sagatuck, it's now 771 people. And 10 years ago, it was uh, 900 and some. Thank you. Thanks, appreciate it. Anyone else in the room? Jim? Jim Bogg, 638 Spear Street. Um, I read the commercial record and I watched two weeks ago and I counted the number of graduates we had from our class and there were like 80 kids who graduated. And then I counted the number of real estate agents and there were like 80 real estate agents <laughs> for the city of Saugatuck. Just look at the paper. Um, you're going to hear from every one of them but you aren't gonna hear from many residents who are gonna to come to city hall where there's no parking in a community where the average age is over 60, climb these steps or take that one elevator, which is its own risk um, <laughs> and sit through a two hour meeting to express their opinion in three minutes. It just isn't gonna happen. You won't hear from the residents that live here. Um, I, I understand everybody has an opinion. Mine is we have too many short-term rentals. So please consider a cap Please consider licensing, revoking the licenses from the non-compliant people, and let's limit it within the residential areas, especially. Thank you. Thank you. Peter Hansen, 441 Spear Street. Uh, currently in a residentially zoned area of Saugatuck, uh, one of the allowed usages is short-term vacation rentals. Um, so my question is, at some point in time, do you get to a threshold where it's no longer a community, but just a, you know, a whole bunch of short-term rentals? We're currently at 30%. What is the threshold where you're no longer a community? Is it 10, 20, 50? or do we have just no limit? The second thing I have is, is that there is no limit on the number of people who could occupy a short-term vacation rental. Um, from what I hear, people are encouraged who are gonna have something at a short-term vacation rental is pack it with beds. The more people you get into a home, the more you can charge and therefore it becomes more lucrative as a short-term vacation rental. And I think probably the biggest complaints will come from the people that have the highest density of people in the home. Then the last thing I did want to ask a question of the officer, uh, when you did the, the number of uh, complaint, noise complaints, was that through uh, 911 or was there uh, a number they could call that was not 911? So people would have had to call 911 to register a noise complaint. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else, Mark? 
I'm Mark Kimball, uh, 550 Spear Street. I just had read an article recently was talking about Key West, Florida, and they've had short-term rental uh, restrictions in place for a long time. And they say now those short-term rental licenses can sell for up to half a million dollars. Uh, so it's not necessarily a negative for an investor if we cap it. And the other was the flip side of that, the unintended consequences that with the short-term rentals cap now, they're finding what were previously three flats are being converted to large homes that are now being rented for a month or more, which doesn't fall under the short-term rental. And they're losing occupancy for workers in those communities. So, you know, you have, what what is a short-term rental? Is it less than a month? Is it less than three months? You know, it's something else that has to be considered. And, um, like uh, Peter just said, you get too many rentals and you just lose the community feel. We don't, you know, we're lucky on, on Spear Street that there aren't that many rentals, but uh, you know, that, that can change in a heartbeat. Thank you. Thank you. Mark, Mark Klungel, 747 Water Street. Uh, I just wanted to make a couple comments uh, on some of the things to look at because the uh, Costco Township has their, in their rental thing, has a, the Good Samaritan postings that have to be done in every rental. Uh, there's a lot of things in, in that Costco thing that you should look at because it's, it's quite good. Um, ten, about yeah, nine years ago, we had a short-term committee meeting and we put together the ordinance that we currently have. And that was primarily a fire code that was in. The fees that were established in that process uh, were up by the, uh, done by the city. City set the fees. The vacation rental management group there, that was back then there were only two of us. So it was Mill Pond Realty and Lakeshore Lodging, which is now Vicasa, uh, we both wanted $200 fee back then. The city picked 80. Um, you'll find that the, the vacation rental, that the higher, you know, the, we, we're not objecting to the fee. That's why I'm trying to understand the, 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 the talk about the fee because the city sets it and the fire department. Um, the, there is a fee on vacation rentals and it's for a fire inspection. Started at eighty dollars. It's up to three fifty now. They've had three increases to get to there, um, but that is only on vacation rentals. Uh, resorts have to have a fire inspection. They don't have to pay that fee. B and Bs have to have a fire inspection. They don't pay that fee. Motels have to have that inspection. They don't pay that fee. So the fee is only on vacation rentals. And vacation rental people are going to tell you we don't care so much about it. The fee is not that important. It can easily be much higher. That's not the point because it takes out a lot of the riffraff or the lower level people are poor quality rentals. Uh, the other thing, as far as the, the fee it's it itself, but the the fire department. When you're structuring a fee fee, this fee was split between the city for administration and half to the fire department to do the inspection. Uh, the inspection is same price for everything. Yet, if you've got a one bedroom unit, it takes five minutes to inspect, it's $350. If you have three one units, three one bedroom units and a 1800 square foot house, it, that ends up being $1,000. Yet I'll have a 6,000 square foot house that'll take 35 minutes to inspect, it's $350. It, it needs to have, make more common sense based on square footage or number of bedrooms taken in consideration. So it's a tiered fee that relates to the inspection process. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. We'll finish up next time, thanks. <laughs> Anyone else in the room? How about on Zoom? I 
Brad? Yes. Me? Yes. yes. Okay, cool. Awesome. Uh, Brad Ba, uh, I have a house uh, that's a short term rental up, uh, uh, up by the Southerner over there. Uh, I actually live over in Hamilton. Um, I have a handful of things that I want to address. I probably won't get through them all, but I will try to go quickly and then follow this up with an email. Um, the first thing I want to address is these, the commentary that I keep hearing about the population loss in Saugatuck. Um, looking at the uh, census numbers, Saugatuck has actually lost population every census since 1980. 1980 is the last time Saugatuck shows a population growth, and it was a population growth of 5.6% over 1970. So if Saugatuck has not seen population growth since the 60s, 70s, and 80s, uh, it stands to reason that population is declining because the population is aging out of Saugatuck, not because of the short-term rentals. So I'd like to get some information or data around why it seems to be there's a foregone conclusion that short-term rentals are responsible for the population decline in Saugatuck when the census does not seem to back up that information. Uh, moving on, uh, second point is uh, I've heard a lot about the garbage, and I will 100% agree with the garbage being a problem. I have actually, uh, in the past administration, sent several, not even several, hundreds of messages to uh, Cindy Osman at the time um, about the garbage situation because the city forces us into a single trash hauler, and that trash hauler, at least once a month during the busy season, misses my house and refuses to come out to pick it up until the next season. So that is a problem that is generated by the city council. I have asked for a uh, dumpster because I do have a large rental and I know that there's a lot of trash, but uh, New Rep Republic Services won't give me a dumpster because I'm not zoned residential and they will only put dumpsters in businesses. So if you want to tackle the trash problem, that is a city council problem. They need to get the crap together with Republic Services and not put that back on the short-term rentals. Uh, thirdly, has anybody actually reached out to VRBO or Airbnb or any of these companies that are actually doing and facilitating the short-term rentals? Because guess what? I'm a software developer and I was a software developer for one of these companies. And as a city council, you can reach out to Airbnb and say, hey, anything registered in our city has to have a permit number. You cannot list a house without a permit number in Palm Springs, in uh, Provincetown, in Key West, in Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. These are all things that are mandated by the city for the uh, Airbnb, for the short-term rentals, along with standard uh, boilerplate language of rental agreements, of contracts, of what are you allowed to do. They, you can actually have the service providers mandate those before a listing can even be made public. Uh, uh, same uh, point, uh, the Airbnb and VRBO specifically will also provide free noise monitoring devices uh, to every single rental. Look it up. It's, it's a partnership that all of them have. I have one at my rental. It's wonderful because I have a swimming pool. People get noisy. I get alerted. I can calm them down. Uh, I have a bunch of other things. I'm out of time. I'll send an email. Thank you. Any, anyone else on Zoom? Nancy? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, hi. I spoke to you before, and so I don't wanna um, belabor my comments. I'm obviously, uh, my comments before were that if I knew now what I, you know, if I'd known four years ago what I know now about short-term rentals, we probably would not have chosen Saugatuck to be our uh, permanent home. I live at 550 Spear Street. Previously, we lived in a high rise in Chicago and the same issue came up only not for short term rentals, but for long term rentals. There was great opposition in that high rise to just even having renters, period. And the requirement was you had to lease your unit for a year minimum. However, people just don't like renters next to them. And we ultimately passed a rule that we capped them at 20%. And once that level was hit, you went on a waiting list. And we thought there would be a lot of problems with that, but it worked, it worked beautifully. So I think that that is a good solution. Um, if we don't cap the rentals, I think that uh, we'll never actually solve the problem. And my last comment is this issue is finally getting more widespread media attention. So as more people become aware of the problem, 
they're less likely to want to choose SolverTech for their full-time resident. So if we don't have measures in place, I think that that's just going to compound the problem. Fewer and fewer people will want to actually move here if they're aware that it's quite likely their neighbors are going to be short, short-termers. Thank you. Thank you. I don't see anybody else on Zoom. You, okay. Um, I think that's it for uh, comments. So we'll close that section. Uh, any closing comments from any of the task force members before we? Okay. Would somebody like a uh, to make a motion to adjourn? Second. 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 Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Thanks, everybody. Thank